Okay. Let me get a glass of water. Okay, I'm wearing this uniform. I served in the Army. Okay, I was drafted in 1965. How it happened, a recruiter wrote me a letter and stating that you were going to get drafted. I said, no way. I'm not going to get drafted. I don't want to go to the Army. You know, the Vietnam War was on. So I said, you know, I'm not going to get drafted. So three weeks later, I got the draft notice. So I ran down to the recruiter and said, what the hell am I going to do? You know, I don't want to, you know, go to Vietnam and get killed, you know, and all that stuff. So what happened? He says, well, I'll make you a deal. I'll keep you out of Vietnam. It's good, good, <laughs> you know, and plus it was September. He told me, you'll go after Christmas. You can stay home with your family, and then you'll go in January. I said, oh, that sounds good, you know, if you believe these guys. But so I went, you know, and then I became an MP. This is a signal for an MP. So I, you know, worked MP, an MP for three months on, no, six months on, and then you work the stockade, you know. So I'm in the service. I don't like it. I really don't. But you do what you have to do. And I didn't go to Vietnam. I stayed in the States. But I might as well sometimes think that it was harsh because I was in there with the anti-war people. Right. So, and they don't like soldiers. I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, they spit on us. They even do shit on us. I ain't kidding. And that was, you know, in there when, when King got killed, when Robert Kennedy got killed. So each one was a demonstration. And the, it's, you know, this kind of, I met Je Reverend Jesse Jackson, and he, we were in, uh, in town in D.C. I was on uh, a day off, so I went to D.C., and they were the Poor People's March. And so I was with my buddies, and he said, uh, I told him, he talked to me, he says, you can demonstrate. I says, I can't. I'll be in jail. You know, I'll be in the stockade. He says, you're in jail already. And so that day, I didn't like Jesse. You know, for a while until I met him again. But, you know, these are stories. While I was in the Army, I would have to say you have to do what you have to do while you're in the Army. I didn't like it. I didn't like the war. You know, there were people who were gun hole. Short timers, you know what the short timer is? You have a calendar of a woman in a bathing suit. And we know where you go when it's short time of a bathing suit. So, you know, it's like three a week. You know, I got three weeks to go, maybe two, two days to go. And then, but I'm up here thinking about all the things that happened, all the guys that you know, that you went to. It wasn't a war, but you think about it. I think about Robert Hangy from Minnesota, John Travick from Alabama, John Pickles from New Jersey, all these guys that you were with. I hope they're still alive, you know, you know, but you just think about the service. You know, when I worked the stockade, there were young kids in the army. 
they had told them, you know, like, you get in trouble, you know, you do crazy things. The recruiter would tell them, you want to go to jail or the army? You know what they're going to do. They're going to go to jail. I mean, no. <laughs> I, you know, they'll go to the army. And so when I worked the stockades, these kids would do four years to do two because they would get in trouble in the army. You know, and I would tell them, you're doing four years. What are you doing to do two? Do your duty and get the hell out of here. I hate this worse than you. I'm going to do my time and get out. That's what I would tell them, but they would, you know, when you're young, you think you're invincible. You can do anything, you know. But I got out in 1968. And, you know, and I think about all the stuff that I went through when, when I got out safe, you know. There's a lot of them didn't get out, you know. That's why I say we want peace. But I say through time, have we ever got to see peace? You know, just like now, we got about three, you know, wars going on, I would say. It's like every day we have something going on. Well, this is my story. I got a lot of other stories, but I'm going to let Mike, you know, take the stands, okay? Thank you. You know, whenever a preacher puts up a watch or, or a phone and looks at the time, you know what it means? And the damn thing. <laughs> So my military experience, I was uh, uh, called down to, I think it was uh, Canal and Van Buren. Uh, no, that wouldn't make, yeah, somewhere down there for the induction center for the, uh, get your pre-induction physical. And I went down there, uh, I was already in a political group, Progressive Labor Party. And uh, so I went down with some of my comrades and they had their picket signs about, you know, US, uh, the war in Vietnam is a racist, imperialist war. It's not a war for the working people, et cetera, et cetera. And I went in there with some leaflets in my hot little hand, and I passed them out. And uh, somebody came out. You can't do that, boy. <laughs> okay. Give me, give me, you know, if I had to give them, let me sit down there. And, and they came up a few minutes later, and they said, uh, we want to fingerprint you. And they went, I'm not in the Army just yet. No. Okay. So I sat there for maybe a half hour and they said, you can get dressed and go home. So that was my military experience. And um, <laughs> another a friend of mine, I think this was in Boston, Denny Davis, he uh, did the same thing. And, with, and the idea was it actually passing out leaflets in the induction center kind of was kind of counter to our program, which was to go into the army and to work with people and to convince people that the war was wrong and that instead of fighting uh, the Viet Cong or the Vietnamese, you know, like Muhammad Ali said, you know, they, I got no problem with them. We should uh, be fighting the oppressor in our own country. So he was drafted. They said, okay, you got your leaflets, no problem. You're going in, Denny. So he was in the army for three years. They tried to kick him out because he was causing so much trouble. And he had a, he was organizing uh, fellow soldiers. He was down at, uh, I think it was Fort Bragg, somewhere in, some Fort Benning, some, some, somewhere in the South. And uh, he had a news, monthly newsletter called The Last Harass. And, and it was very popular and they had a lot of, you know, raising her out of cane on the base, and they tried to kick him out and give him a dishonorable. He fought to stay in the army, and uh, he won. He gave him a general, I think. But any event, that's just by, that was my and my friend's military experience. 
So um, the question today is, uh, we're talking about Tony's military experience and how to work for peace in a world at war. That's our question. And I have to confess, I've been grasping at straws on this. Uh, it, 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 it's been very difficult for me. This is not going to be so much a sermon, but sort of a therapy session for me. For me. A lot of dilemmas, turmoil. We now have two wars raging. Thousands of people are being killed, have been killed in the Ukraine in the past two years. In the past month, 11,000 Palestinians. Millions are displaced, their homes, their schools, their hospitals destroyed. But there's so much more. In Africa, military takeovers, coups, ethnic conflicts, people displaced. Thousands of Africans and Middle Easterners have perished in the Mediterranean, seeking safety, refuge from war and destruction, and a chance of a better life. In Central America and South America, hundreds of thousands are fleeing government violence, corruption and poverty, gang violence, for an uncertain future, and an often hostile reception in the United States. In Asia, Burmese Muslims face ethnic cleansing, the Rohingya people. Uyghurs in China faced unparalleled oppression. Concentration camps they're forced into, labor camps. In Afghanistan, women are brutally repressed. Violence, repression, miseries, and atrocities seem to be the norm. Where can a man sit under his own fig tree in peace and security, as the prophet said? Now, now especially, I dread to watch the news. What's the point of watching buildings burn or women weeping over their dead children, a six-year-old looking for his parents blown up by a missile? And those who occupy the seats of power do nothing to stop or even ameliorate the suffering or they seem to be powerless themselves. We have our vigils. Southsiders for Peace held two these past weeks. Tomorrow I'm going to go to a, join the Jewish Voice for Peace in an action demanding a ceasefire. But I ask myself, What's the point? What do our signs and the horn honking and the fist raise and solidarity do? What do they do other than make me feel a little better? Maybe a little proud that unlike others, some others, I'm on the right side. In the face of unrelenting atrocities and suffering, sometimes I feel hopeless. And useless. And this, I believe, is an entirely rational response. I want to turn off the TV to avert my eyes to be like Candide, who after suffering <clears throat> and seeing horrors and massacres sang, should have you up here, Maria. <laughs> We're neither pure nor good. We'll do the best we know. We'll build our house and chop our wood and make our garden grow and make our garden grow. Turn off the TV to do the crossword puzzle or listen to sports radio to make my garden grow. To turn my eyes is sort of a survival mechanism, but it's more than that. I turn away my eyes because I sense there is nothing I can do. Who benefits from my discomfort or even my sorrow? No one. No missile is turned aside. <clears throat> no child finds his mother or father. No doctor can heal a wound because of my pain. 
So what's the point after all? What's the point? Somebody said, despair is the greatest sin. My mother told me from her Catholic training that blaspheming the Holy Ghost, that is succumbing to despair, was the one unforgivable sin. And it is hopelessness, despair that makes me turn my eyes away. And so when millions of people in Ukraine, Gaza, wherever, whatever blighted, oppressed land you care to name, whenever these people persevere, holding their bleeding children, dig through rubble to find their parents, walk hundreds of miles to an uncertain safety. Do I have the right to despair? To give up hope that some small action multiplied a million times can make a difference? So I console myself with the old truisms, the Chinese proverb that says a journey of a thousand li begins with a single step. The song, Step by Step, I think it might be my favorite song in our hymnal. Step by step, the longest march can be won, can be won. Many stones can form an arch, singly none, singly none. I don't know if Holy Mother Church was right, but I think my mother was right. I do not have a right to feel despair. It would be a betrayal of people's suffering. But opposition, anger, and sympathy is not enough. We need people in the streets. We need, I can't believe I'm saying this. We need people writing their senators and congressmen. We need churches taking stands. And as an old, somewhat beat up, radical, and former communist, I look through the world events through the lens of class struggle. When armies are marching, when the bombs are falling, I usually figure someone is fixing to get rich or richer or take over oil and minerals somewhere. It's an old story. Young man marching off to war to make someone rich. It may not be the whole story, but it's always there. Well, in any case, I don't intend to give a lecture on dialectical materialism. That would bore you to death. But as citizens of the most powerful country in the world, in the history of this sorry world, we need to pay attention to what our leaders in government and business are doing and why, and we need to figure out what to do about it. And so we may tend our gardens, but let's look up every so often, up to the sky and search for the bombs that may fall and seek a shelter and a refuge and an answer for ourselves and our fellow travelers in this world of war. Thank you. <laughs>